Good evening and uh, welcome to this Holberg Prize event, the Holberg Laureate Live. My name is Björn Enge Bertelsen and I'm the academic director of the Holberg Prize. A special welcome, of course, to the 2022 Holberg Laureate, Professor Sheila Jarsanov, and to Professor Katrina Holst. They will have a conversation tonight on the theme Expertise, Democracy, and the Politics of Trust. Now, as you may or may not know, the Holberg Prize was established by the Norwegian Parliament in 2003. The prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The University of Bergen has appointed a board for the Holberg Prize. The Holberg Prize is intended to increase society's awareness of the importance of research in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. Every year, the Holberg Prize is awarded to an outstanding scholar within the research areas covered by the prize, either within one discipline or through interdisciplinary work. This year's laureate, Professor Sheila Jarsanov of Science and Technology Studies at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University is one such scholar. She's one of the world's most influential scholars in developing the field of Science and Technology Studies, STS. Jasanov has also forged a unique interdisciplinary body of research at the intersection of the social sciences, humanities, arts for people and economy, SHAPE, and the STEM disciplines. In addition, Jasanov has developed much of the conceptual repertoire for theorizing the political and policy relations of science and technology in contemporary societies. Her theoretical contributions to the political sociology of scientific governance are transformational, recognizing that scientific practices and knowledges along with the policy and legal frameworks governing them must be understood as culturally situated and socially constructed. This topic of particular interest for us here today is captured in her collected essays, Science and Public Reason, which was published in 2012. In recommending Jasanov for the Holberg Prize, the Holberg Committee notes that Jasanov is a significant public intellectual who offers timely comments on topics of public concern, such as fake news and climate change. Crucially, Jasanov combines a high level of conceptual creativity with empirical rigor and accessible writing. Indeed, Jasanov is read not only by humanities and social science scholars, but also by natural and medical scientists and policymakers, her work being truly wide-ranging and cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary, as it were. Now, Katrina Holst is professor at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography, University of Oslo. Previously, she was research professor at ARENA Center for European Studies at the University of Oslo and associate professor in the philosophy of the social sciences at the University of Bergen. Holt has been leader of several research projects on the role of expert knowledge in democracy and published extensively on democratic theory, political epistemology, and public policy. Until recently, Professor Holst was head of the board for the Science Studies Colloquium Series at the University of Oslo. In 2020, 2021, and 2022, she's leading a multidisciplinary research group at the Center for Advanced Studies in Oslo. In 2022 and 2023, she will be visiting scholar at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at University of Cambridge. The topic for this evening should fit Professor Jasanov and Professor Holst very well, as it is expertise, democracy, and politics of trust. We all do really look forward to this conversation. Katrina Holst, the floor is yours, and we should give them a round of applause.
Professor Yasanov Sheila, if I may. Uh, congratulations with the 2022 Holberg Prize. So this is yet another expression of the immense significance and importance of your work. And we are so grateful uh, that you have taken the time also to visit Oslo. So I know that your schedule on the West Coast has been, uh, the, the, this last week has been breathtaking. Uh, and still, we are very lucky then to have you here this uh, Friday evening. Um, I think it is uh, no exaggeration to say that you, both in the book mentioned by, uh, by Bjorn and other books, have, have provided us with concepts which have changed our understanding of the relationship between science, policy and democracy in a, in a fundamental and groundbreaking uh, way. Uh, consider, for instance, the concept of co-production. Instead of saying that there is science and scientific knowledge, scientific development on the one hand, politics, policy making, policy on the other, uh, you have uh, learned us rather to focus on how science evolves together with political institutions and discourses. Or take your uh, illuminating notion of civic epistemolo epistemology, uh, which denotes the culturally specific expectations to how our government produce and use knowledge and expertise. And your specific idea of public reason, referring to how ruling institutions justify their authority and use of power and their practices of argumentations. And how you then emphasize that public reasoning in this sense uh, varies significantly between polities and over time. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is a very recent, maybe ongoing, uh, incident where this concept can help us clarify and explain the different governmental societal responses and practices in different countries. So arguably, what we have seen during Corona times is exactly how different civic epistemologies, different public reason practices, different regimes of co-production play out even in an exceptional time of crisis. So <clears throat> this also comes across very clearly in the cross-national study that you have conducted together with colleagues, summed up in the report Comparative COVID Response, Crisis Knowledge Politics. Some of you may uh, know it, I'm, I'm sure. Cross-national study of the policy responses of 16 countries. Not Norway, I think, among them, but, but Sweden among the Nordic countries and many, many others uh, from around the world. So I, I thought maybe we could take this study uh, as our point of departure and then we can see where our conversation goes. And I think also at some point uh, we can have comments and questions also from, from the audience. So in this report then, uh, in addition to spelling out and explain the vast variation in COVID-19 policies, you and your colleagues also try to draw some general lessons and you start out in the report elaborating on some common fallacies in how we understand crises of this kind. So uh, take the idea that a crisis can be understood as a play with a predefined script, the idea that we would generally know what would happen. So you and your colleagues say, no, players may decide to throw out the script and play a different game. So the predictability here is rather limited. Or take the idea that in an emergency, politics take backseat. Do you say no? Pre-existing economic political systems matter immensely for how a crisis is managed. Or what about the assumption that indicators of success and failures are clear and outcomes can be well defined and objectively measured? You say no. During the pandemic, we have once more learned that outcomes measures are always value-laden, always contested. Or the idea that science advisors enable policymakers to choose the best policies, you say, not really technical knowledge is subject to interpretation and experts really speak with one voice. Or finally, take the idea that distrust in public health advice reflects scientific illiteracy. You say, no, this is clearly a vast oversimplification. There have been debates about the facts also between experts, not only between expert lay people, and we have seen expert recommendations change rapidly during the crisis. So, <clears throat> I mean, you can... Feel free to comment on this as you are inclined to, but maybe one uh, place to start would be to ask you to say 
which of these fallacies or misunderstanding, misconceptions are the most uh, serious? Uh, I mean, if you were to say just one thing, I mean, stop this, you cannot go on thinking, doing like this. Is there kind of an underlying flaw here yeah. uh, that, you have, that we have learned from this and that you have seen in this study? Well, Katrin, thanks for asking that question, but like any good interviewee, I'm going to use it as a jumping off point for saying things that, that I would like to say. So, in a, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> in a sense, in a sense, um, the uh, situations at the moment are old hat. That is, people have already thought about them, and disasters and crises are nothing new in our lives. The epidemic, the pandemic, has been seen coming for a very long time. I mean, some of you may have seen the film Contagion that was written as a kind of precursor, and that was based on the SARS epidemic, I think. I mean, so, although nothing has hit the world on this scale, the fact that a pandemic is something to worry about, it has been with us for a very long time. I remember, I think it was in December 2015, I was asked actually to come very nearby to Lund because there was a meeting of the European Commission and they were discussing the 10 great challenges facing the European Commission. One of them was pandemics. I mean, you know, so it's been there in um, policy thinking for a very long time. I myself got into disaster studies very early in my academic career because I started out looking at chemical regulation in the very late 1970s. And behold, in 1984, you had what was then and still the world's worst industrial accident in Bhopal in India. And that was a disaster that had many of the attributes of other long-lasting disasters like Fukushima in 2011, for instance. So STS scholars have been thinking about what it is that makes disasters like disasters. And one of the things that's been noticed by social scientists ever since the mid-1970s is that post hoc, you can always say that a disaster should have been seen coming. So it was always there in hindsight, and people say, well, hindsight is always 2020 and foresight is not. But the interesting STS question there is, why is that true? Why is it that you look backward and all these signals were already present, and then looking forward, what happened to those signals? Why did they get erased? So in that sense, some of the things that we say about those fallacies in the report that we wrote are quite old hat. They were not surprising to people who had... So, but the thing that's surprising is why, it's, why is it surprising to each new generation of policymakers? I mean, if we knew it, then why are they surprised? So, so that report was an occasion to try to put in pithy form um, things that in some way were not new news to STS scholars. It was an attempt to do again, another kind of translation. And we can talk about this later because I found that that translation really is very hard. It still continues to fall on deaf, e deaf ears in a sense. So what makes the ears deaf is a big problem for STS. But I'll tell you what I found most surprising and it takes us off in a direction that I hope is appealing to you. Because yeah, I would very much like, because this, this was my hunch, that you would not be surprised, sort of, of these yeah, right. policies. But, but, what but policy makers, policy makers mm -hmm. are still surprised and do not want to buy into these. So, so I think there's a genuine problem there about, about some of these issues. I mean, the one salient thing that they always talk about is that knowledge was ignored and, you know, that this is the reason that we failed was that people made mistakes. But if so, then people are continually making mistakes and, and you know, then we should create a world that in which either we expect mistakes to be the norm and then we build the worlds differently or we should delve more deeply into why is it that people in a recurrent way make certain kinds of mistakes. Um, and my preference, as some of you may know, is not to give the answer. It's because our brains are hardwired the wrong way. I mean, I find that a very troublesome direction to go. But again, we can come back to, come back to that. But here was a study that we were doing among... Um, 
16 countries by the time the project really wrapped up. And they include six countries in um, Asia, six countries in Europe, and uh, the rest, the Americas and Australia. Um, and the countries in Asia included um, Taiwan, China, Singapore, um, South Korea, Japan, and India. So very different kinds of political systems and so forth. And of course, the going characterization of China in America and probably also in Norway these days is authoritarian form of government, right? And similarly to a slightly more benign degree, Singapore as well. And, you know, South Korea doesn't do fantastically well on the democracy index. And anyway, it's... So, of course, those countries succeeded because they had authoritarian governments that could impose the rules. This was the reading in the West of what was going on in some of those zero-COVID countries. So one of the most interesting comebacks we got was from our team in Singapore, who said, that's not the right way to look at it. That the right way to look at it is that Singaporeans, by and large, enjoy an exceedingly comfortable form of life. They have had decades to see since independence to see that their government has made decisions that has produced a very good set of outcomes for them as a society. And there are very few people who uh, are willing to dissent from that, and therefore there is a great deal of willingness to believe that confronted by a crisis, their governments will do the right thing. It's as if this has been put to the proof and tested already enough times that they are willing to put their trust into the government to manage this crisis as well. Now, that, in a way, is very consistent with what theorists of democracy from STS, such as myself, say about Legitimacy, that legitimacy comes from conducting repeated experiments or demonstrations in public of things going right. So if that is true, that leads to a kind of radical rethinking on our part about what this authoritarian versus non-authoritarian is about. I mean, you know, one has to deal today with the fact that the Chinese government enjoys a great deal more support from the DEMOS than the American government does, yet we are the democracy. So, you know, that is a kind of paradox that I think we have to wrestle with. And, and to me, sort of, not, not the sort of old questions of why doesn't knowledge flow from place A to place B, on which we have a lot of work already, but how is it that some countries uh, manage to persuade their publics that fairly, restrictive forms of government are nevertheless okay for the public good, whereas in other countries, most notably mine in the US, people are absolutely unwilling to accept that, that anything restrictive cannot be right and you know, sooner distrust the science than trust the restriction. I mean, that is what liberal democracy has sort of you know, come to come to be these days, and and that's a you know, it's really an inversion of a lot of things that we used to think. Yeah, yeah, and and this is also <coughs> connected uh, um, to what I read as a central point, also generally in the report that our trust in expert knowledge and expert bodies is very closely connected to our uh, levels of trust in public institutions generally and what and and what kind of and the and the social cultural political background conditions of of that and this results also in high trust in expert bodies and expert knowledge of course also in some democracies uh, uh, where where there is this high general level of of public trust but i wonder also uh, but i wonder if you could say also a little bit what constitutes this uh, general uh, high public trust. What I mean, uh, if if there is this, if it is a case that that uh, um, trust in experts rely uh, or depend on trust in public institutions generally, what then uh, what then causes this general trust? So what political scientists typically will say is that. Uh, trust in public institutions is also very often uh, related to uh, quality of government. You know, that there is this um, 
uh, that there is expert autonomy, expert, uh, independent expert bodies, that public administration is uh, un relatively unpoliticized and so on. So there is also the, the, the relation the other way uh, around. So there's, I mean, it, these are deep and complex questions, and, and I think that one of the purposes of research is really to get to the, to have a sort of ongoing reflexive sense of what is it that makes societies work, and you, you were kind enough to mention my comparative work. The reason I like doing the comparative analysis is that it's such a brilliant demonstration by the world that you do not have to construct one single idea of the good world. I mean, in that sense, we're all, you know, operating with a kind of secular theology, if you will, that, the, that we are committed to building good worlds, but they do not have to look the same. And I have lived and worked in Germany and in the US and the UK. I mean, these are my three sort of mainstay countries of comparison. And then, you know, I also know India, obviously, pretty well. And, uh, and increasingly, I know some other countries at all, but uh, as well. But, but it, I keep going back to Germany and the US because they're such, you know, standard opposite kinds of extremes. So on the sort of empirical detail side, there's lots of fascinating details that need to be collated and, and will hopefully be in the book that we're in the middle of producing. Mm. But one of them is the way in which these different countries went about constructing expertise on the pandemic. Um, Germany had the most sort of, we have a designated public health authority and we're going to trust that and the Robert Koch Institute, which goes back to Germany's long-standing preeminence in public health and public health related data collection uh, was the institute that was so designated and it maintained a very strong level of public trust and it enabled Angela Merkel, well, I mean, not it enabled, which is too deterministic, but, but she was able to get Germany's lender, which are not by any means equivalent in their political systems or whatever, to agree that for the greater common good, it was necessary to follow this way of doing things. So interestingly, in both Britain and France, it was not a long-standing institution that people went back to. I mean, Macron, just the way he's created a political party of his own around himself, created an expert body that was designated for the purpose. It was purpose-built. And in order to accept that this was the most trustworthy body, in a sense, you had to believe the expert in chief. And people did make fun of Macron because, I mean, there's a nice cartoon showing Macron pulling aside his mm. shirt and showing the Superman costume, you know, inside that, that because he, uh, he was, well, I mean, as you know, Macron likes to lecture the citizenry and, and he was interpreting epidemiological evidence for them and saying, you know, Emmanuel knows best. I mean, you know, so, so did people trust that or not? I mean, I think, in a way, Marine Le Pen forces them to trust Macron, right? But that's a different kind of trust mm. from, from the kind of trust. I mean, and similarly, Donald Trump caused Biden to be elected. I mean, it's not because the people trust Biden, it's that they didn't want this other thing. Um, but, but that's a very unstable form of democracy in a way where people are being driven by you know, negative feelings. And uh, so, but the entire, post-war history of Germany has been built around a set of ideas about how do we produce consensus, how do we have people not go off the rails in extreme directions. You have the apostle of deliberative democracy. Mm. I mean, increasingly, I think you have to look at these people like Habermas, not as theoreticians of the world, but as crystallizers of the theory of their own country, in a sense. Mm. I mean, you know, so, so I think that... that if you read and understand Habermas, you will read and understand a certain thing about the political geist of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these are the sorts of areas in which, I mean, where we're moving to with this study is that in order to understand the place of expertise and why trust more mm -hmm. generally happens, you have to go back to constitutional basics. You have to ask, what are the social compacts that underlie the way these countries 
operate. And I think my contribution to that thinking is that it's probably the first body of work that says, look, you cannot think about constitutionalism in the modern world without taking the role of science and technology seriously into account. Because we have delegated so much power to the expert bodies and communities and forms of knowledge and methods of knowing that de facto for the last couple of hundred years, we have been writing this kind of unseen constitution with expertise, mm -hmm. which nobody bothers to question because you know, there's no second amendment about expertise. I mean, so you know, you can't you can't go there. Um, but that I think is where I mean, if you will also join me in this project, that the self-reflection of society, of political society today, has to delve deeper into why are we delegating particular kinds of decisions to this or that kind of body and what are the unseen rules that are underlying our, our trust in them. I think that it may be destabilizing at first to ask those questions and I think people are reluctant, therefore, to go there. But I also think that to reconstitute our, our political systems with any kind of robustness, we will need to go there. We will need to ask, you know, what, uh, why is it that we're you know, sort of saying, at this point, my knowledge stops and your knowledge begins, and I'm going to put my life into your hands. So my guess is, from what you are saying, is that you are not, uh, you, you uh, like to tease out the variation in, in political and social life. But still, you touched upon it now, there is around in public discourse is grand diagnosis of, what, of the relationship between experts and citizens, the role of experts in democracy. And you have these competing diagnoses on the one hand. You have people talk about now this is the death of experts. People, we live in post-truth politics. People don't listen to experts anymore. There is this populist critique of elites and experts. So this is a one grand diagnosis. And then you have, on the other hand, what you also uh, alluded to a little bit now that there are also, on the other hand, there is this fear of, of too much political power to expert, that we see actually uh, a rising expert rule. And it was, I think both, the, we lived with both these diagnoses also during the pandemic times, and we saw expressions and examples that sort of confirmed either of them. Uh, but I wonder if you have had comments uh, to that. I mean, you could uh, say which of the diagnoses are would be most generally apt, or would you rather say that this is not? Uh, my guess would be that this is not would not be your your entrance into into this. Well, so I keep emphasizing a couple of things. One is that there is the sheer empirical richness of the world, that people do not do things the same way. And I think it's extraordinarily liberating in a way to discover how other people do it. Partly it may make you come home and prefer your own, because all in all, this is what you like. I mean, so people often come to America and go back. Well, particularly people who come to my program often tell me that they they're often from this side of the Atlantic, and they tell me they discovered Europe after they came to STS at Harvard. So I think that's, I think that's meant to be a compliment. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they discover what, like an Italian woman was the first one who told me this. And you know, I think she discovered that out of the chaos that always is Italy and is the charm of Italy, there still is a sort of underlying Europeanness to some of the commitments, and and you know the, there's no question that a kind of public solidarity is far easier to generate um, in the European countries than it is in America. I mean, in America you can find a particular state where it's relatively easy. I mean, Massachusetts could be a part of the European Union, and sometimes people talk in that way, that the new secession should recombine the world, you know, by different constitution constitutional predilections. But the, I mean, take something fundamental during a public health crisis. What is going to happen, who is going to be responsible for your health and for what happens to your 
job in relation to your health. If you do not have a national health insurance system, then you're on your own. And you can be on your own for the treatment costs, you can be, you're absolutely on your own for unemployment costs. If you die, your family's on their own for doing something with the body, your children are on their own. You know, there've been heart-wrenching articles written in America about children who lost both of their parents during the COVID crisis. And, you know, who takes care of them? I mean, you know, by not having a state by saying, we believe in individual entrepreneurship and the best solidarity is the solidarity of all individuals working to bring their own capacities to fruition however they can. You know, we have essentially in a time of need taken away the, the communal thing. Um, so, you know, this is, I mean, it's led me to think about the, the idea of sovereignty in a very different way in the course of the pandemic. I mean, so what do we mean by sovereignty these days? One thing that became very clear was that countries were not in this in a united way, that nationalisms very much came to the forefront during the COVID crisis, which bodes ill for our dealing with climate because for climate, it is completely obvious that we need to work as a global entity. And I think one of the follow-up questions from the pandemic will be, you know, given that the pandemic caused everybody to retreat and national borders were created. I mean, you know, people are talking about, like yesterday I was talking to somebody who was saying that um, the one member of the spouse was from Australia and that person was going back for the first time in three and a half years because Australia had completely shut itself off like China. So, you know, how does that feed into a world where uh, cross-border solidarity is needed? So, so that was, you know, clearly one thing of interest. But a more theoretical thing is, you know, we are people at many levels and public health deals mainly with the physical level, the, the, the body and its, its well-being. But we're also other kinds of beings. I mean, we're political beings, we're social beings, we're spiritual beings. And the question of who is responsible for that <clears throat> has generally been sidelined in other ways. In America, I was trying to make sense of the litigation that arose very quickly, and it took various... Um, well, one form it took was a lot of lawsuits about churches staying open. And it underlined the extent to which the public health body, the body that the public health enterprise is responsible for, is detached in America from the communal and religious and spiritual body. You can even see the current composition of the Supreme Court as a kind of assertion of, a reassertion of that other kind of sovereignty in this highly, you know, religious, I mean, the, it sticks in my mouth to say that America is a religious country because there's so much non-religious feeling, you know, in the country, but, but organized religion does well in America. And, you know, so the, the degree to which our modern states have delegated to different expert systems of rule a capacity to exercise essentially sovereign powers and then not consider that we as individuals do not live in one of those domains and not in the other of those domains, right? So we've delegated economic sovereignty to a whole mess of institutions, including central banks. Mm. We've delegated public health sovereignty to these public health bodies, and that's been done without a set. There wasn't a constitutional convention that says, mm. yeah, in these times, this quarantine requirement can be imposed. It's, it's just done, and that's that, and you accept it. And if you challenge it, maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't. In Taiwan, there was where they had very, very, very few cases. One person tested positive and was put, you know, in quarantine. And after many days, like maybe even 40 days, that person tested positive again. 
And so they reimposed the quarantine, and the person said, you know, I can't be infective any longer, and I need to be let go. And the, this was one of the few disputes in Taiwan, and the state's answer was, no, sorry, as long as you test positive, you're going to stay put. And, you know, so there was a total acceptance of the public health authority, but at the same time, the way Taiwan closed its borders before the Wuhan virus arrived was that some insomniac public health, their CDC, the Taiwanese CDCs, some person was listening to the radio on New Year's Eve late at night and heard about this virus and called up the uh, colleagues in the CDC to say that the next plane coming from Wuhan ought to be stopped, basically, and people should be tested. And that was the way that they caught the virus. You know, this is like early January, and our shutdown was on March 13th, as I know very well. So, you know, that's two and a half months never happened in Taiwan. But it says something about the degree to which the CDC has been empowered and authorized as this case that I suggested also illustrates, to exercise complete control of the population in the name of public health. In America, we don't have that. We have a whole lot of libertarian possibilities for people to come and say, sorry, this is only executive power, it's under emergency, the emergency didn't authorize it beyond 30 days, and you need congressional you need the state legislature to authorize it, reauthorize it. We've had a lot of litigation of that sort, or, or you know, the churches should be exempt because of religious freedom. And besides, it's irrational to say that that churches, um, you know, that restaurants can function but churches can't. I mean, you know, these sorts of agreements, uh, these sorts of arguments have been made. So, you know, it's it the. The point is that the empirical differences, which are fascinating in and of themselves, are interesting because they force you to go a step below and say, what is the nature of the glue, the political compact that's holding people together? Yeah, and I, I really like your idea of thinking about the role of experts in democracies, also in these constitutional terms that we too seldom does that explicitly, and I mean this is this is I think a very important part of part of uh, your work to do that. And this also raises the question I think of what we think about when we talk about expertise, both in pandemic times and and and, and generally. So um, my sense is that it's central to your work in this analysis of the the, of the comparative uh, COVID response, but also generally to. Uh, contest the idea that there is a special privileged role for scientific experts among the experts, or I may be right, wrong about this, but, but you know, what is a policy expert? It's, it's, some, it's not uh, only scientific experts, but probably they have a role. What do you think about that? Also, uh, you also emphasize a lot in your work, which is very important, I think, that there is a lot of expert disagreement I mean, and this is very often um, under-communicated. So, I mean, by proponents of evidence-based policy making and so on, they talk about as if experts always agree on what to do. Uh, but at the same time, um, there, there is probably also, I mean, also during the pandemic and even across countries, I don't know how you see that, there were also um, not only expert disagreement, but also expert consensus on things. I mean, on vaccination policy, on probably on some effects of or measures, and so on. So how how should we? Uh, and and in the cases, and in these cases where there is expert uh, consensus, uh, in uh, um, what it, do we then have a firm ground to recommend policies? Do you think? If science, in the cases where the, our best scientists agree that you know these are the effects, and if you want to achieve this or that aim, this would be a good thing to do. 
do we then have a sort of a firm foundation to say that we should go for this? Well, I mean, these are crucially important questions, and I should make clear that, of course, I think that there's a special place for scientific expertise, and science is multiple and varied, and it's a question of which scientific expertise mm. often, and then it becomes a question of, well, who decides, you know, what is the relevant kind of scientific expertise? I think that the work that not just me, but my colleagues in STS do, absolutely accepts and respects scientific consensus and scientific expertise. These are social facts in the same way that a table or chair might be a social fact. I mean, that is, if scientists agree, then that is a good reason. I mean, similarly, if we have a nine-member Supreme Court and all nine members say something, the law that they're articulating has more power than if it's always five to four or six to three or whatever. I mean, you know, it starts looking political if it's constantly riven. I don't think there's any difference between, you know, across institutions that if people agree, we as a general matter take that consensus to be stronger. I mean, you know, I think it's a tenet of child rearing. Those of you who have children will perhaps recognize it, although it may not matter as much in Norway. In America, it's certainly a tenet of child rearing that parents should not con constantly be issuing contradictory advice to their children, that <laughs> the children grow up a bit more stable if they're hearing the same thing. Otherwise, they, of course, are very clever and pay off, play off one parent against the other. Mommy said this, and, you know. So, so you know, it goes for any kind of social organization that a consensus is a more stable and more powerful thing. But that should not preclude us as analysts from asking, well, what is the basis for this consensus? I mean, you can have nine people who have been brainwashed all saying that this is the right solution, and the emperor's new clothes, after all, is a, is a myth of this part of the world that was a, a profound critique of consensus. It said that the child's eye, untrained and unideologically biased, can look through and see that the consensus is hollow, right? So that's not always the case, but I think that to, it, I think it's a dangerous thing in a democracy to set apart a line of work and say that this is a mommy knows best domain where the experts no longer have a responsibility to explain things, right? I mean, and you talked about my work on public reason, and it's really an effort to say, well, okay, if we accept as a basic constitutional principle, you're going to have authority over my life, you better explain to me why you have that authority. We demand it of our medical doctors. I mean, we say, get a second opinion in these cases or whatever. I mean, you know, we don't take unexplained, I am going to do this, period, as a very good way to, to delegate authority. So when it comes to experts, people do sort of tend to forget that. They mm. tend to take the consensus as legitimation in and of itself. And I think it should never be legitimation in and of itself. I think it's a powerful fact. It's a powerful piece of evidence that you can take on board, but then absolutely you should dig behind and say, well, how is it that they came to this consensus? You know, did they take alternative views on board? Or, you know, are they all from the same school of thought? I mean, if it's economics, were they all trained at Harvard and MIT and therefore have a particular view of, of economic policy that, that, you know, what happens to a field that, forget Harvard and MIT, that essentially has ruled heterodoxy out of itself and therefore accepts only one kind of solution. But it's not only in the social sciences or in economics that you get that, you get that in the natural sciences as well. I mean, people become captive to certain ways of thought. And so I think that, of course, expertise matters. We are all experts in one way or another. And, you know, it's just that it should not become self-validating, self-executing, self-justifying, self-legitimating. It should be subject to the same kinds of critical analysis that we you know, bestow on any other kind of authority. Hmm. Yeah, and I uh, <coughs> completely with what you are saying, and also what you're saying also pushes the, 
discussion, or maybe the, the, that the more important discussions are not science or not, or consensus or not, but what kind of expertise, yeah. how, it is, or how is it organized? Is, this a, is it a relevant uh, kind of pluralism that is involved here? And this also points to, to things that are, have been important to your work regarding uh, the importance of multidisciplinarity. Um, and, and also, another thing that I wondered what you think about is also another slogan that you often hear in these debates is the importance of democratize, uh, of making expertise more democratic. So I wondered if you could, I mean, both these are probably strategies of making expertise more sensitive and more contested, more pluralist in the way that we want it to be. Um, but what do you think about uh, these, these different strategies of, of attaining that? Yeah, so, uh, of course, what I think of these things has changed over time, but what I think of it now, um, as soon as people say something like democratize, of course, you have to ask, you know, what, what? what is the underlying model of democracy they're dealing with? And the STS is sometimes caricatured as saying, oh, simply bring more voices to the table. And I don't think that that is what STS says or what would be a good prescription anyway. And even pluralize, I mean, you know, lately people have always been asking me the question, well, you know, does it mean that you should let the QAnon people into the, into the room and ask, let them talk as well? I mean, sometimes I think, yeah, why not? I mean, it might actually get your complacency bubble to burst and then, you know, maybe that would be a good thing. But, but you know, I don't usually say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's the meta principles, right? I mean, that is, if you're going to keep somebody out, there should be a warranted basis. And that may be society specific. I mean, some societies may actually thrive on letting what others would consider to be the lunatic fringe, you know, into the room because they have a radically democratic attitude. I mean, we know, for instance, that ideas of madness are not the same across societies. And some people think that the mad person is endowed with a kind of divinity that actually allows the mad person to bring radically contestable ideas into a place where the juxtaposition of A and not A, the radical opposite actually produces some kind of leavening in the system. But if you go to the, you know, the sort of Ur ancestral parliaments off there in Iceland, again, I mean, it's interesting how often your regional experiences actually have a salient bearing on the ways that we might be thinking about democracy. But Iceland is a very small place. And if you have the the divinely inspired mad person in the ting, I mean, you know, maybe it's not so bad. I mean, maybe even sitting out there in the, you know, cradle of volcanic earth, you have a very different idea of what madness and civilization might be about that would not be the same if you're Foucault sitting in Paris. I mean, you know, so, so these things are very culturally specific. And I think that the the generalizable point is that is to ask whether the modes of reflexivity are there or not, and whether we have, under this rubric of expertise, act, actually shut off the possibilities of reflection because we've accepted that there is a self-warranting machine that would go by itself. And you know that I think is a is a really dangerous place to put one's governing authority into, that we should always be prepared to question governing authorities. But what form of pluralism is itself an open question? I mean, there's a project that we're doing, and I would love to have anybody in this room who wants to either talk about it now or have ideas contribute. We call it the Global Observatory for Genome Editing. And the starting principle for that was the observation that up to now, in the life sciences and technologies, which some of you know, it's a big domain of my research, the 
countries and societies that are, quote, ahead, unquote, in the research have also called together the deliberative bodies. I mean, so in the life science, in the genome editing business, it's particularly striking because they've already held two things that they call summits. And the third summit was supposed to happen this past March and got postponed. But the summit, I mean, think of it, it's the global, you know, coming together of the people who are supposed to be talking about what? They themselves say it's about human evolution and the human future. They say that, not me. The scientists say that. So do we think that a summit constructed by the British Royal Society, the American National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, that that is like a global summit to decide what the future of the human genome should look like? I mean, you know, that surely that idea is as off limits as QAnon, and yet we don't say that that's crazy people doing crazy things, right? I mean, you know, so, but then once you've seen that that surely cannot be the way to go, it becomes a big, huge question, so what is the way to go? And so in this observatory, we're trying to put together in sort of little bits and pieces <clears throat> conversations around salient aspects of the meaning of humanness and bringing together people who don't ordinarily talk to each other, beginning with the global south and the global north. I mean, there is a big absence of, of dialogue because the professional business of ethics to some extent has been colonized by the same countries that have the lead in the sciences, and so they don't necessarily recognize as ethics things that are put in a different discourse and not in, you know, therapy versus enhancement. I mean, you know, maybe those categories don't make any sense to anybody else. And yet, if you say therapy or enhancement, you can have a big debate with anybody who does bioethics in the North. But, you know, like what's at stake? I mean, similarly with climate, mitigation, adaptation. Everybody gets mitigation and adaptation until you go out into the world when nobody has a clue what those words mean. So, you know, you've constructed the expert domains where the language is also determined by the experts. And then if you speak it, that's a great entry card. You can come in and you can say all these things. If you don't speak it, then you're just, you don't belong. So we're trying to disrupt that, but the rules of productive disruption are not laid down in the world. And economics has ideas about what a disruptive technology ought to be. I don't think political theory has yet really evolved the, I mean, we, and there's a lot of literature on revolution, <coughs> but, but you know, there's not as much of a literature on political innovation that is disruptive in a way that tests norms without completely disrupting solidarity. Sheila, we have now um, limited time, so I will soon open up for questions, uh, but I had an, but I have, you know, we have a little bit more time. I could either ask you about uh, SDS, and you know, your, you, you mentioned already that you think that there are insights from the SDS that has not been taken properly up uh, by other fields in academia. Maybe you could also say then a little bit about challenges for SDS, how to achieve this, and I mean, the way ahead for SDS. The other way we can take the conversation is that I asked you for advice regarding uh, the local context here, how <laughs> we should think about, you know, uh, the Norwegian science policy ecosystem or system of, of co-production, how, 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 how experimental should we allow ourselves to be as we stand here, not only as, you know, social scientists or whatever, but as citizens in, in trying to reform our system. So, where do you want to... This would be extremely hubristic of me to comment on the Norwegian research system ecology, about which I know only dribs and drabs at the moment. And So, I'm just inspired when you talk about these experiments doing things radically differently, because very often in, 
in, when you think about policy reform and, and trying to do things differently and better, yeah. one think very often in very incremental terms. And there are often good reasons for this. For example, we have this, I've studied in my research, the committee systems. We have this, just in Germany, this broad consensus-oriented policy advice committee. So a way to work would be to try to reform these committees, for example, so they better take up adequate yeah. levels of pluralism and so on. So, so, but I mean, another way would be to think, no, why should we work on the existing system? Why should we experiment more with, with other things? So this is more, not necessarily advice for this system, but maybe the relationship between thinking incrementally when you work on institutions uh, compared to ec well, more I, radical forms of experimentations. Well, it could take forever if I were really to address those points, but one of the thing, things to note is that in talking to somebody like you, I'm talking to somebody who has a highly well-developed you know, field of scholarship and experience, and it's not, I mean, it would be really foolish of me to bring prescriptive things to this conversation in a way, but, but you know, so what can one say? Um, I mean, I think a very general STS point would be to say that for experiment to succeed as a method, or not to succeed, but even to produce some kind of evaluatable results, let's say, there has to be a lot of agreement beforehand like what constitutes an allowable experiment, ethically what is desirable, is it normal science, is it not normal science, is there a paradigm within which one is con conducting that experiment. So experiments are attractive ideas and I like them myself and in my own building of the field of STS, I've conducted a lot of mini experiments, mm. you know, by trial and error, but it's based on both a lot of collegial support, so I know I'm not doing something completely off bounds, and a real understanding of the constraints of the system within mm. which I'm operating. So one can look cross-nationally at all kinds of things, but it's clear that what works in Germany cannot be imported, you know, 100% into America or vice versa. I mean, you know, people just would not put up with it. People's understanding of a very profound thing is people's understanding of what risks they're willing to put up with is very different from one place to another and country to another and and even forms of activity against each other like like you know extreme sports are tolerated in America and yet the same people who do extreme sports on the weekend will insist on wearing masks outdoors mm. and high summer weather, you know, at a low point <coughs> in COVID because they're worried about transmission to their small children who haven't been vaccinated, even though this is like magic. I mean, there's been no demonstration whatsoever that the virus could possibly transmit by that that pathway. And, you know, it it just shows that, that you know, I mean, maybe it's a universal property that we all are con continually ne negotiating, you know, bounds of reason and unreason within ourselves. And, you know, so you, you can't sort of tell people this is the way you must do it or, or that is the way you must do it. But experimentation, once one takes for granted that there has to be some method to it, I mean, you know, some agreed upon norms that this is a right way. I mean, is there a control to that experiment or are you just throwing the pebble into the pond and watching, you know, how it will go? And, you know, like performance art might be con contrasted with experiment in a way. You know, people who will go and do weird things in public and sort of see, but the, it's just the seeing, the upsetment mm. that becomes its own thing in a sense. But unless there's a beholding eye to record that and say, you know, yeah, that really made a difference or whatever. It's not the kind of social experimentation that we're talking about. So, yeah, I think that even the idea of experiment in public life is itself a theoretically interesting domain for us to think about. And, and then, of course, in using history, which mm. one might, talk about a little bit, one might think about times in which reform efforts were undertaken 
But an STS person would say, where did that idea of the reform effort come from? Was there, in effect, some kind of continuity in the society that this is what people thought about? So, for instance, in America, a lot of experiments are about privatizing. Right? I mean, you know, this has been public. Now let's privatize it. But that's based on a sort of, you know, underneath current that the private sector, the market, is always the more effective answer and not the state. Um, so it's e like even the experimentation that happens has a certain ideological direction that it tends to follow. And, you know, again, becoming alert to that and saying, well, let's not do it that way. You know, that could be productive at times, but I think that's very, it's going to be place specific. It's going to be, you know, based on the collective experience of, you know, I mean, I know enough about Scandinavia to know that mm. what works in Denmark wouldn't necessarily work in Norway, no. wouldn't necessarily mm. work in Sweden, right? And I think that the close history of what happened during COVID would probably illustrate that mm. quite well. Mm. Um, we have then, the, I, people can now prepare for maybe a question or two, but you feel free also to comment on my, on, on the SDS uh, question. Regarding, um, because you, we, you mean, we really why start, we, it get yeah, taken yeah, we started or? really up on that. That you said, I mean, f you said for SDS people, nothing of this is surprising. You know, the, all the fallacies in the in the COVID study. Uh, but then you said, but again, for other scholars and for policymakers, this tend to be surprising again and again. So, why is this um, so? Why, why is um, uh, why do you think uh, insights from SDS scholarship is not taken up more broadly? Is it a problem also uh, only with you know other fields and society outside? Is it a problem also for you know? Is there something the SDS people does wrong? Do you think if it's well, again uh, an ongoing answer because it couldn't be an answer. It's a conversation I have with myself and with my colleagues and so forth all the time, uh, but. That would take very long, but uh, I mean, one very easy thing one could say is that the, the authority we've given to science didn't happen overnight. I mean, it's mm. something that we have built up and built up and built up over hundreds of years. And one of the things we've done is draw this very sharp boundary between science, which is answerable only to the natural world, we think, and, you know, so lit reality validates science, whereas everything else is contingent and constructed and people have no trouble understanding that. So to break that down and say, sorry, no, these things that you took to be nature are really conveyed to you by human in institutions and these are all contingent, it's, it requires a, a real reshaping of one's mind. And I find that you know, Harvard is an elite institution. We accept these days less than 5% of the people who apply, and the ones that apply are already very selective. And I'm firmly convinced that this means we get minds that are already trained into a, into a mode of accepting the orderliness of the world in a certain way. I mean, you know, these are 17, 18 year olds who come in already having done college level research and so forth. You're suddenly going to tell them, sorry, no, that was socially constructed. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, and the, then the people in power. I mean, so the number of times that they, um, well, I'll stop with just one very quick example that is on my mind because, I mean, one thing I'll tell you that doing STS means that you're continually fascinated by everything that happens because it's all infused with science, technology, rationality, experiment, evidence, proof. I mean, it's just, you know, it's an eternal drama. It's like being, you don't have to go to the theater. The world is a theater. It's an ongoing place of play. So today, the CDC announced, the American CDC, that the, in some of you may be affected by this, that the day before test to go to the US will no longer apply as of Sunday of this week. Now, this has been a very irritating thing for travelers for a very long time. We got caught by it in March mm -hmm. ourselves. We had hardly any symptoms, and then 
tested positive, had to spend an extra week in Oxford. But you know, the, the travel industry has been saying, lift this, lift this, lift this. So today's article in the Washington Post, the first sentence is about how they're lifting it, an unnamed source with knowledge of the proceedings says. The second paragraph says that the CDC decided on the basis of science and evidence that they could lift this. Now, anybody with half a brain in their heads knows that the travel industry has been at the Biden administration's door day after day after day. Okay, so, but it, no, no, it's the science and the evidence. But if you look at the science and the evidence, there has been a bell curve of opinion. And the most, to me, the most compelling one is, why are you telling people if they come from London to Boston that they have to test the day before, but if they come from Hawaii to San Francisco, they don't? I mean, what is so great about the territorial limit that from Hawaii to Boston, you don't have to worry about who got exposed to what? I mean, are Hawaii's borders so tight that the virus was completely different? I mean, no, it's sort of sovereign territory asserting itself. It's public health sovereignty declaring, you know, I am the, I am the territory in some sense. But then to continually go back, and the media accept this too, and to assert, you know, in a blind way, this is because of science and evidence, without taking any account that the science and evidence has been open to different kinds of interpretation. STSs call it interpretive flexibility. I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to say that the CDC decided prudentially that given the weight of the arguments and the sort of seemingly endemic status of the virus now, all of the United States, this closing of the borders no longer makes sense as a public health thing. It was different when there were different pockets. It was different when the variants were uncontrollable. But they don't say that. They instead go back to the science and evidence. And, you know, that is something that we really, we deserve better as citizens of intelligent societies, not to be given this door closer, you know, here is the science, as if we're all ignoramuses and couldn't understand it if somebody told us mm. something different. But for that, we need every university to have a proper STS educational uh, institution built within it. And we, we have that here, I know. think. Yeah, <laughs> I think there are people from that here. Um, are there uh, questions, comments from... Yes, please, maybe you can present yourself as well. Hi. Is it? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Emma Lengel. I'm a doctor, and I just finished my MPH, or Master's in Public Health at Harvard. Um, and one of your fellows, Carl Dudman, recommended a book to me, um, Field Notes on Democracy, by Arundhati Roy. And I wanted to ask you a question about that, because one of her main themes in the way that I read it is about the formation of common sense, the way in which experts use language to produce narratives and form what is um, heterodox and what is not, what is um, rational, what is not. And I, myself entering academia, am worried about my own role in oppressing other ways of knowing, other ways of understanding the world. And I see my own biases in the way my mind has been formed through my education. And I feel the pressure within academia to write in an esoteric way, in using certain you know, boxes or certain language to describe phenomenon that I'm experiencing. So I want to know from your experience, how do you see your role in, um, do, do you feel that you sometimes oppress other ways of knowing? How, what, what role do you see in um, you know, creating a form of knowledge or a narrative that is inclusive and non-oppressive, is it possible? And, and so how do I strive to move in that direction? Yeah, well, I'm important. not sure that I buy into that initial proposition that creating knowledge has to be oppressive. You know, sometimes when you're trying to show somebody something, uh, you need a new language to do it and let's displace it for the moment from language to some other medium of communication. Like, 
were the Impressionists oppressive when they told us that the play of light could be seen with little brush strokes that took apart the world in a certain way? People don't tend to talk about different artistic visions as oppressive. They do say, of course, it was a new language in the field of art. And, you know, again, I don't think that I mean, where it becomes oppressive to me is where some alternative way is being shut down, not simply that you have opened a new window and created a new vista. I mean, maybe my thinking here is profoundly colored by the fact that I speak multiple languages, and I don't consider any of them oppressive. I consider them all liberating in their own ways. And they do have shades of meaning, and they do group the world in different ways. Um, but, you know, one has to, I mean, where it begins to sound oppressive is where you insist. And as you know, the, you know, different language communities fight back. I think France had another of its episodes recently of, of trying to push back, you know, Franglais in, in some domain or another. But maybe it's oppressive to assert the primacy of the mother tongue in that way. I think it's exceedingly um, promising and you know, optimistic that you have learned to think in these ways about your own role. But what is it that you're keeping out? I mean, I've worked enough with people in the botanical realm to know that um, one of the things that people worry about is that non-technical indigenous knowledge or community-based knowledge will not find its way into circulation because although more organic and synthetic in some ways, that language doesn't qualify for the kind of um, disaggregating and fundamental uh, classification approaches that are, that are congenial to the natural sciences. But does it have to be that way? I mean, why isn't it possible for the scientist to be able to say, you know, I understand that I am grouping your world. I mean, this is where you come into my genome territory, that, you know, I'm not presuming to say that the beauty of the object is captured by my molecular level analysis or understanding, but nevertheless, I too have a level of understanding, and it is best captured in, in thus and such ways. So, I, I mean, I guess this goes back to, Katrin, your point about pluralism, that to me, pluralism is something about the respect accorded to other moral universes in which the metaphysics may be different, without necessarily feeling that one's own which, after all, also has a morality to it, right? I mean, there's a reason why you're looking at the world in this way. So, you know, I don't think it has to be an either-or, and it can also be in conversation with. Uh, so, so, you know, that's my idea of cosmopolitanism, where you accord respect but do not, you know, sort of eschew the value of your, your own position. I'm not in favor of a world where all of my you know, young protégés suddenly start seeing themselves as the oppressor because they're at Harvard. I mean, you know, <laughs> they have something to contribute even if they're from Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably a relief. Uh, a brief, uh, um, we are running a little bit out of time, a brief question from... If you are very brief, you can have this one in the front as well and then Sheila can sum up. I will try. So, Sheet Rumenzweit from the University of Bergen. Th thank you very much for a very, uh, very rich and fruitful and interesting conversation. Um, so, uh, Sheila, the question is, uh, I would like to go back to the COVID case that you started out with and perhaps ask you if you could look at it also from a slightly different point within your scholarship. So you talked very much about going back to the nation state, right? And, and nationalisms that reassert themselves and, and so on. But, but you have also written quite a lot about the role of international institutions. And so, I mean, one thing that would come to mind is the role of the WHO, right? And how it would be aligned with certain uh, segments of the state, like certain 
parts of the health authorities, you mentioned the CDC and, and so on. So th that would, could imply a strengthening of the state in certain aspects, depending on, of course, um, the, the local conditions of that state. A, a different, different example could be, and I'm, I'm going to be brief, <laughs> Um, well, in, in Norway, as in many other countries in Europe, we wanted to develop this digital contact tracing for the, for the COVID pandemic. And, and many, many countries wanted to do it nationally. It turned out to be really difficult uh, for technical reasons. So in the end, everybody ended up using you know, the, the platform uh, produced by Apple and Google. That they merged together their efforts. And also because they could say they could claim to be in accordance with the GDPR, so that the privacy um, framework of the European Union, right? So they implemented privacy by design, and thereby it was bona fide. And then we could go ahead, which actually resolved the the controversies around these apps in many countries. And and a third case could be, you know, the role of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so, so these would be cases where also the international dimensions and maybe the private infrastructures are also asserting themselves and, and maybe even states, at least small states like Norway, become you know, dependent. They have to trust as if, as Brian Wynne would say, uh, some of these um, uh, infrastructures and actors. Yeah. Do it, uh, just a super short question from you as well and then you can answer both of them if it's fine. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, so you've been talking about how um, we shouldn't really just blankly trust experts and also given examples of how the media don't necessarily help in that attitude. So I was wondering whether you could say something about what sort of responsibilities and expectations we should have to the sort of average layperson, non-expert, when they or to form opinions about uh, questions they don't really have the expertise to answer uh, in a society where there is a certain expectation that everyone should have opinions about everything. How, how should they proceed um, given the complexity of... Okay. Um, really difficult questions in a way, both of them. Um, on the international institutions point, um, you know, I came to the West because my father joined such an institution, namely the United Nations, and, and so I grew up very much a believer in globalism and have gradually had to unlearn various things uh, while still maintaining, as I said before, a belief that many of the problems of our world absolutely have to have global governance, and I think you were alluding to the fact that I write about these things. But, you know... I think it just forces one to get serious about it. I mean, so the WHO, you know, when Trump pulled out of it, it just revealed what... I think most people actually don't know. I mean, it's not considered a question you'd have to answer on a citizenship exam, you know, who funds the World Health Organization and how vulnerable is it? I mean, so the, we've designed these... You know, you're familiar with the idea of designing something to fail, right? I mean, in a sense, we've designed the institutions of global governance to fail in a, in a lot of respects. But if one is serious about global governance, one has to give up certain things, you know, certain dimensions of sovereignty. And with the International Criminal Court, for instance, you see that the U.S. never signed on and so forth. So, you know, sometimes in my classes at Harvard, I'll put up a map of various things where the non-signatory states are indicated. And over and over and over again, it's the US and two or three other states that you know, almost don't count. And I say, you know, what right do we have to call everybody else rogue states when we are the rogue state as far as international governance is, is concerned in some sense? So I think that the, I'm a, I totally believe that we have to think seriously about these international agreements. I think one could write the history of the COPs in climate change as a learning field in which I think we've got somewhat better over time, even though it's not by any means perfect. But with the WHO, you know, we, you know, if we didn't, ha people often say if we didn't have it, we would need to reinvent it. I think it's a little bit true of the WHO, but, but we would, 
have to reinvent it in some other ways. I mean, ways. I mean, for instance, vaccine equity is a very serious problem that has come to light in the pandemic. Is the WHO able to deal with that? No. And one could therefore ask, well, why not? And what would need to be done in order to have an organization that is somewhat capable? It seems that the WHO's main capability has been that it has the exclusive authority to, to declare that now it is a pandemic. But that's not a very wonderful, you know, thing to bestow on an international organization. So, and, you know, one could spend a lot of time talking about, I mean, obviously you would be interested in the apps given the previous work you've done, and, but I think that would occupy us for too long. And, um, but, you know, the general point is that the international arena is absolutely essential, just as expertise is absolutely essential, but then it's a design problem and, and you know, and given that no design is going to be flawless, the question is, you know, how does how is there learning built into into that domain? And then about the media and representation of expertise, and you know, it is a little bit funny how I mean, it's not it's not that experts need to know something. About, it's almost as if we've we've invented societies in which give us a question, any question, and people will think there is an expert about this question. And you read the newspapers, and there are some really weird examples. I, I was collecting them for a while in my COVID isolation. Like, there was an article once in the Washington Post about the, the particular challenges of COVID for um, intercultural couples. And they had gone and consulted experts. And I was wondering, you know, how does one become an expert on like interfaith or into whatever relations during COVID. I mean, like you got training to do this. I mean, you know. So, but then the question becomes, why do we think that there should be an expert to everything and not, you know, some kind of collective judgment? I mean, that, that you know, surely this in itself is a kind of monstrous dream of the sort that Goya illustrated with his sleeping figure and the bats flying around. I mean, you know, we imagine these bats of experts, you know, sort of populating our heavens in some sense. But, it, you know, who are the right experts for something? You begin with the empirical if you're an STS analyst. You look at the things that they do not, you know, are there systematic exclusions? Uh, such as when, you know, out of my own big bucket of experiences, the, the British science advisor once said in my presence that m mothers don't have any place in an expert committee on child obesity. I mean, you know, so what, what de definition of expertise? I mean, this goes back to your question a bit. And, you know, and the, a mother in the audience had to say that, you know, we are going out and buying the food for the children, and maybe we have something to say about why it is that the choices are, are you know, made the way they are. So I think that it's a, an ongoing discussion where we turn to experts and expertise and why we think we have to conjure them out of a hat every time we need something, that we have to manufacture an expertise. You know, are there other ways of doing it? And often there are, and it's called deliberation, it's called consultation, it's called public engagement. That is, you elicit the value or the you know, way of being from people who are involved and not you parachute it in from outside as somebody knowledgeable um, who may or may not be. I'm sure we could go on, but we have to close down now. Thank you, Sheila, for sharing with us your th very thought-provoking reflection and your, I like to say, your wisdom, really. So this was really uh, interesting for everyone here, I'm, I'm sure. And thank you also for questions and, and comments and for, for joining us here. Do you want the final word? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much mm. for having me.